Alright, it's your friendly fishmonger Dan from DansFish.com and um, today I'm going to make a video for you on the American flagfish, uh, Jordanelle floridier, um, which is this beautiful killifish. It's actually a pupfish from Florida and um, it's fantastic at eating algae and it's, it's a beautiful, hearty, inexpensive fish. And I'm going to show you today how I keep them um, how I breed them, what I do with the eggs, and what I do with the uh, fry, and then how I raise how I raise the fry up to adults. So I'll take you through the whole thing from um, every detail of how to do that. If you've never kept killifish before and you want a first stab at it, these are great. They're they're hardy and they're inexpensive and they're readily available, and um, you can spawn them in mops like like a lot of killifish. And so it's a, good, uh, it's a good one to get your feet wet on. So anyway, um, here we go, let's start. All right, so here's my tank of flagfish. Um, and it's a very, very simple setup. Like most of my aquariums, I keep it bare bottomed. Um, it has a sponge filter for biological filtration. It has a box filter for mechanical filtration has some floating water sprite, at least a little bit. These guys eat plants, so <laughs> there's some left. And then um, it has that spawning mop in the bottom there that you see in the in the frame. And that's it. That's, that's the extent of the aquarium. Oh, and a lid. I keep a lid on all my aquariums. Just because I don't like fish jumping out. Um, anyway, these guys are a killifish. They are a, a pupfish, in fact. Um, like the Devil's Hole pupfish, that's probably the most famous of the pupfish because it lives in such an extreme environment. Um, but these guys come from Florida, hence the species name Floridae. And um, they're the only member of the entire genus, Jordanella. There used to be another fish called Pulcra, which um, is from the Yucatan in Mexico, which was called Jordanella Pulcra, but recently it's been changed to Garmanella. So, as of this moment, the scientists say that this is the only fish in this genus. They're always changing their minds, but for now, this is, um, this is it. So it makes it a pretty special fish. It's pretty unique. Um, in fact, back in the day, they used to think that this was a sunfish, like a, a bluegill or a long-eared sunfish, you know, that, that, in that family. And it was a while before they realized, no, this is a killifish. Um, part of why maybe they thought it was a sunfish is there's a lot of reports of these guys breeding like fun sunfish like them um, you know excavating a little pit the eggs get laid in there and then they care for the eggs now I've never seen that I've kept these fish many times over the years and I've never seen that behavior but enough people have reported it that it might be you know something that actually happens and part of the reason maybe that I have not seen it is because I keep my fish, you know, in these bare bottom tanks. So yeah, I, I keep my tanks really simple, and that might be why. Maybe in a, a bare situation like this, they breed differently. Um, the way they breed for me is in typical killifish fashion. They will swim into the into the spawning mop there, into that green yarn, and they'll deposit their eggs. Um, I don't see them guarding the eggs or taking care of the eggs in any way and I just pull that mop out um, and pick out the eggs like I do with any killifish species and that's how I, I that's how I spawn the fish that's how I raise the fish um, so I'm not saying that they don't spawn like sunfish I'm just saying I've never seen it in the few videos actually come to think of it the few videos I've seen um, where people are saying look it's guarding the eggs um, to me that just looks like territorial behavior, like a male guarding a territory. It, it doesn't look like nesting behavior. But some people swear that they see them fanning the eggs and that if an egg, you know, starts drifting away from the nest, that they'll pick it up in their mouth and spit it back in the nest and things like that. So if that happens, then that's pretty cool. That would, this would be the only killifish I'm aware of that reproduces that way. But again, I have never seen it. Um, Let's talk about temperature. These guys, I, I keep them in the mid to upper 70s right now. They um, are currently at like 77 degrees. Now they can take it warmer. Florida's waters get pretty warm if you've ever been there. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, and they can take it cooler as well, uh, you know, winter temperatures. So I would 
they take a broad range. They're pretty a pretty easy species temperature wise. Um, in my temperatures, in the mid to upper 70s, they breed great. The eggs hatch, the fry raise, they're healthy, they're happy, they're displaying. Um, so uh, this works for me. Now, as far as water conditions go, they, um, they come from pretty hard water. I mean, Florida is basically an extinct coral bed, and the water there is just extremely hard. But I've kept them in that kind of water, and I also, right now, I keep them in very soft water. And they've done fine in both environments. I spawned fine, everything's been fine, no matter how I've kept them. So I don't think water parameters are, are that uh, critical. And I think one of the worst things you can do with any fish, pretty much, is chase water parameters. Um, just keep the water clean, free of uh, ammonia nitrites, and don't mess with pH. Uh, that's my general advice. There are some instances where you might need to, but I, I think that's very rare. Um, as far as eating, these guys eat everything. <laughs> they are so easy to feed. They'll eat flake food, pellet food, rapashi gel food. They'll eat frozen food. They'll eat live food. They'll eat algae off the walls and off the bottom of the aquarium. They'll eat plants. They, they eat everything. So um, they're great for algae, by the way. They pick it clean, um, but they also eat plants. Uh, I have them in with water sprite, and they, they just munch on those water sprite leaves down to the stems all the time. So they might be okay with like Anubias or Java fern, you know, something with a, a tougher leaf, but, but I haven't tried it. So, so if you use them for algae control, I think you can do that, but you'll have to keep an eye on them if you have plants in your tank because as soon as the algae is gone, they'll start nibbling on your plants. In fact, they might nibble on your plants a little bit while they're eating the algae. But they do do a good job of removing algae. Um, I've heard people say they eat hair algae. I've heard people say they eat uh, even blackbeard algae. I haven't tested that, but they're, they're reported to be a fantastic algae eater. Um, aggression. These guys can be a little aggressive to each other. They can be a lot aggressive to each other. If you have two males in a tank, they're probably going to kill each other. Um, these do great in a large group where they can establish a pecking order and no one gets, you know, pecked to death. Um, and even in a bear tank, they're, they're just fine like that. But I would be very careful of keeping only a few or a couple together. If you did that, you'd have to make sure you have tons of hiding places and cover and things like that. And I still don't think it's probably the best. Uh, most, uh, most fish just do so much better in larger groups. So I would encourage you to think about that, especially with this fish. Plus then they interact, they, they spar, they spread their fins and display, and they're much more entertaining to watch. You get those beautiful colors. They just look like jewels with those bright spangles on them. They're an absolutely gorgeous fish. Um, anyway, they're, they're very easy to keep, um, a little aggressive, and they will eat plants, but that aside, they're, they're a great fish. Um, and they're not so aggressive to other species, like uh, they'd be fine with rainbows and barbs and other fish like that. Not guppies, not anything slow or with long fins, but with a lot of species they'd be just fine. Anyway, I'm going to show you how I breed them now. Okay, so I just pulled that spawning mop that we saw um, in, in the video just a second ago. And I, I found some eggs, let me show you. So, here's one right here. Um, that little guy there. Here's another one down here, right above my finger. Um, in fact, let me show you, pull it off there. That little thing right, right there, up on my finger there, that's, ah, I'm sorry, it's hard to keep it in frame. <laughs> there we go, that's a little killifish egg. And, um, so what I do is I take these, I take them, I put them in a small container of water, and I add just a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. Um, maybe there's a, two cups of water, if that in the container, and I put in three to five drops of hydrogen peroxide, the three percent hydrogen peroxide that you get from from anywhere, <laughs> really. And um, I change the water twice a day in the morning and in the evening. Sometimes I do it on my lunch break as well, and I will put in uh, 
three to five more drops of hydrogen peroxide each time I change the water in with the fresh water. And that keeps the eggs from fungusing. Um, and there are times when I'll pull a mop and I'll, I'll get a hundred eggs from these guys if I've let it sit in there for a couple, three days. They're very prolific um, when they're fully adult and they're healthy. They, they give a lot of eggs if you feed them well. So if you want uh, to see detailed video on the egg containers and the hydrogen peroxide and all that, then um, if you look at the Wapoga Red Laser Rainbow Fish video, then um, it's the same method I use for those, the, the same incubation method. So if you look at that, it's the same thing that I do for the killifish. So I take the eggs and then once they hatch, I transfer them to a small container and um, let me show you that. Alright, so I wanted to show you how I start uh, my Florida flagfish when I'm breeding them. Um, this is where I put the eggs um, as soon as they hatch, so I, I guess the fry. This is where I put the fry as soon as they hatch. I check the uh, egg container every day and when I see fry I take them out and I put them in here. And as you can see this consists of, it's just a small little, you know, plastic 99 cent Tupperware from like Home Depot or something. And in there I'll put three or four snails. I'll put a cherry shrimp, sometimes two if I have a lot of fry, but usually just one. Um, some leaves that have been in my cherry shrimp tank. And some java moss, java fern, some plants. Uh, in this one I have java fern. I'm sorry, java moss. And I just put that in there to uh, give them a little shelter has some infusoria and things on it for them to chew on. And then I put the babies in here and we should be able to see quite a few in here. Let's see how close I can get in on here for you. There, there's some. So these are Jordanella floridiae. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, Jordanella floridiae maybe. It's the uh, American flagfish, which is actually a killifish and not just a killifish, but a pupfish. Um, native to the United States. Uh, pupfish are an amazing group um, of killifish and they've adapted to some of the harshest conditions that you can think of. Uh, salty desert pools, um, really um, places where most other fish could not live. These guys are from Florida. Uh, their, their parents were wild caught so these are F1 fry and they have a little cushier. They, they live in better water uh, with quite a bit of food, but they're still pretty darn hardy. And as long as I keep the water clean, they do fine in my water, even though it's very, very soft. So this is what the little guys look like. Um, some of these have just hatched. Others are about a week old. And then to feed them, what I do is um, I feed them Microworms. So this is where live food comes in super handy. So let me show you this culture. It's just a microworm culture. Um, and if you see all this, all these worms crawling up the sides, um, and on this side too, that's all tiny, tiny little nematodes that are crawling up the side. And when they do that, and they're out of the food that's at the bottom, then they're really easy to harvest cleanly for the fish. So what I do is I just take a plastic knife, scrape some of them. So you got a bunch on the knife there. And then I just put them in the container with the fish. Um, and they'll live in there oh, all day pretty much. Um, and the fish will eat them at their leisure. The little fry will. I'll also feed these little guys some powdered food, um, golden prills, pearls, powder food, um, it's the 5 to 50 micron food when they're first starting out. Um, and I, I'm actually still feeding them that now, as well as the micro worms. Um, if I had more fry, I would go ahead and hatch brine shrimp as well, but I've only got a couple of containers of fry right now, so it's not, uh, micro worms and powdered food are just fine for them. So uh, once I really get cranking out, I'll, I'll do some brine shrimp as well. Um, just to give them something else to eat too. But anyway, they're growing really well. The ones that are about a week old are twice as big, if not bigger, than the ones that only hatched out a day or two ago. Um, 
and yeah, they're going. So it's really important in a, in a container like this, this is a pretty small container, to change the water a lot. So what I do is two to three times a day, I'll dump out the water and I'll put in um, aged tap water basically that's been through my carbon block so it doesn't have any um, uh, chlorine in it or anything. And I will do that two to three times a day just to keep this container fresh um, so I can feed them a lot so they can find the food and grow quickly. These guys are actually big enough now that I'm going to transfer them very soon to a five and a half gallon uh, tank to start their grow out. Um, and then after that I'll transfer them to a larger container. But anyway, that's how I deal with the baby uh, Jordanella Floridiae. Uh, now here's what the fry look like uh, a little later on um, when they've grown up a bit. These guys are, oh, maybe the oldest ones in there are probably about a month old. They're getting, they're getting on about half an inch in size, maybe a little less. Um, but they have a lot of bulk to them. They're like little bulldogs, so <laughs> the length uh, the length isn't uh, as important. They're still like kind of a big, robust fish, even at a smaller size. But um, there's there's well over a hundred fry in here. This is a 30-gallon breeder tank. Um, in a little bit, I'll, I'll show you the uh, a wide shot of the tank and exactly how it's set up. But there. They're fine in big groups. I do have some java moss in here. I do have a, a spawning mop so that the smaller fish can get away from the larger fish because I have uh, spawns in here that are divided by you know different hatch dates. So there's some in here that hatched a couple weeks after the biggest ones. So I need to give them somewhere to hide. Um, and also just because I think that plants help absorb waste a little bit in case there's a little decaying food in there or something like that. Um, there's also a whole bunch of snails in there to help with that and there's a cherry shrimp uh, one single lone cherry shrimp <laughs> in there as well a, a group of cherry shrimp would be great I just I don't have that many right now so uh, the one that was in their hatching container ended up in there with them <laughs> when I dumped them in so he's in there um, but they eat really well I feed them crushed up flake food They'll also, at this size, they'll eat frozen brine shrimp, they'll eat frozen blood worms. I still feed them micro worms too for the smaller fish. And um, really small kind of uh, powdered fry food as well for the smaller guys. So I put a lot of food in, I feed them three to four times a day, and they grow pretty quickly. Um, they're already getting their adult patterning, not coloration yet, but, but patterning, yes, those black dots and things like that. Um, anyway, they eat well. You can see they have uh, full bellies and they're happy and healthy and they're just growing right up. Um, every day I change oh, about 50% of the water in this aquarium on the automatic system. So uh, actually every night. So once every 24 hours they get about a half a tank water change, 50% water change or so. And that keeps everybody healthy and happy even with all the food that's going in there. So, um, they're cute little buggers, man. I, <laughs> they're just, they're like little baby bulldogs. I mean, they're, they're just so cute running around in there. Um, anyway, let me show you what the larger tank looks like to give you an idea of what the setup is um, on a different scale here. Just a sec. All right, so here is uh, the larger grow out tank. Um, they went from that small container into a five and a half gallon and now they're in this 30 long or 30 breeder excuse me and it just has that sponge filter in it um, an overflow for the automatic water change system um, and then a spawning mop and some java moss some water sprite up top here again the best plant in the world because you can't kill it in my experience anyway and um, that's the extent of the tank and a lot of snails, I guess, to help clean up uh, any uneaten food. And these guys do great in here. They hang out on the bottom, mostly. They're uh, kind of bottom to mid water fish more, but they will go up to the top to take food as well. But um, yeah, that's this is how I raise them out to adult size in here, or juvenile size, big enough to go into a, a large tank with a normal community of fish. All right, so that's the video for today. The American flagfish, uh, great little fish. 
And if you have any questions or comments about that or um, about anything at dancefish.com or what have you about fish in general, <laughs> then uh, leave them in the comments below and we can get a discussion going. Anyway, thanks for tuning in and I will see you next time.